Well, it's very exciting to be here, and I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you a little bit about the speed of change in today's work environment, and Yachtek set me up perfectly because I think you're going to hear some similar themes. In fact, I think we all like the speed of change, uh, but I don't think we like it very much when it starts to impact the workforce and all of a sudden it becomes extremely difficult for us to engage the talent and attract the talent that we need to be successful. In fact, this is my first time to Warsaw and I can't believe the level of growth. And when I talk to the teams here and how things have changed, particularly in the last 30 years, I can't imagine what you're all dealing with as you continue this change and, and all of this growth. But let me see if I can give you uh, just a few helpful hints to help you get through this. In 2016, Charles Schwab actually predicted that the greatest um, societal uh, concern that we have as we roll into the fourth industrial revolution is basically the lack of skills um, and the lack of um, you know, ability to I interpret the data, right? We don't all have to be data scientists, but we have to be able to interpret that data. And so the, the skill set's changing for us dramatically, and actually there are people that predict that we're going to be left in an environment where the high-skilled workers and people who can, you know, strategically leverage the data are uh, left, um, you know, are, are there with the high pay, and then the rest of the workforce is left behind. And in fact, more and more people are getting extremely concerned about this. And so my guess is all of you in the audience today, whether you're a business leader, a CEO, or an HR leader, you're trying to figure out how to deal with this situation and what is it exactly that you're going to do to overcome them. You know, we know many of the uh, transactional jobs or the uh, lower value jobs are really being taken over by technology. Yatsek talked about that um, earlier. And more than half of your candidate pools today, by the way, believe the jobs that they're applying for are going to go away. They also believe that you, as employers, are not doing enough to help them. You're not doing enough to upskill them, and you're not doing enough uh, to help them get ready for, for the next job. Um, the other thing is we're seeing an environment where how we work is changing. So whether you're now working from home, or I, I don't know about you, I've been on the road for two weeks living out of one little suitcase, uh, and I haven't, I didn't bring my laptop. I've literally been working off of my phone for the last, last uh, two weeks, and that actually worked out far better than I could imagine. But we're working in a WhatsApp culture, right? Uh, I have one customer who is working in a no-boss culture. I'm sure my boss would love that one. So, you know, the way we work is changing. Technology is changing the, the way we work. And, you know, the uh, skills and the um, job titles and the types of jobs that are being created are changing. So by 20, uh, what is the number, 2030, basically the prediction is 85% of the jobs haven't even been invented yet. And whether or not you believe that that's true, many of the jobs that we have today haven't even been around in the previous decade. So we're definitely in for change. And think about it, if you can see some of the job titles that are up there, you think to yourself, well, why would we ever need a space nurse? But we're already selling rides for a million dollars to space, and somebody has to treat people when they're on there. So that's, that's a job title that's not too far away from our reality. Uh, so the niche skills, are gonna become more and more important. We just heard that in the previous presentation as well, right? And so how will we prepare our workforce? And we'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. 
Yesterday, I was on this stage as part of a panel, or not a panel, as part of a debate panel, actually, with some of my colleagues over there, and there's a debate over who actually won. But um, what, what we talked about was our female organizations or female-led organizations, are they more profitable? And at the end of the day, we all agreed that it's really a diverse uh, workforce and a diverse leadership organization that uh, at the end of the day makes you more profitable. But this uh, change with AI and robotics, robotics, the first people impacted by that are going to be the female workforce. More than half of those jobs today they're, they're held by women. They're the lower paying jobs and they're held by women. So in an environment and in an economy where we know we need to promote female leadership if we're gonna have more cross-cultural organizations, if we're gonna have more profitable companies, if we're gonna have a more engaged workforce, we need to be able to work towards reskilling our, um, our female population who are in these lower transactional jobs. Jobs. They will be the first ones uh, impacted. So the other thing that I think we'll start to see happen is the, the way the job titles or the job requirements change. And I think, you know, if you thought about some of these and you talked about some of these with your HR leaders, you know, 10 years ago, the, you know, process skills, social skills, those are, those are things that you see on a regular basis. But what you're starting to see is where, how, what's your experience around emotional intelligence intelligence, active listening. These are things that we're seeing in job descriptions today. In fact, if many of you are still writing traditional job descriptions, you're going to have a tough time recruiting the kind of more professional talent that you need because, frankly, all of the skills we need in today's environment don't exist. You have to find the experiences and the attributes, some of what are listen, listed here, in order to power your, your job description of the future. I think the, one of the most interesting things that I'll talk about uh, today is the fact by 2050, more than a quarter of the population, maybe with the exception of, of Africa, is going to actually be over 60. So for the first time, we're going to have five generations in one workforce. Five generations in one workforce. So where you think your you know, grandparents are retired, that's, uh, that's not actually the case. So I would ask all of you, how prepared are you to have five generations in your workforce? Uh, the difference between a traditionalist, which someone in the workforce born after 1946, right, and then the Gen Z that is born after 1995, these, in, these individuals are sitting side by side, and yet you're going to engage the workforce. Now, I think this is really good news. It sounds like it's going to be hard to manage through, but it's actually really good news because think about the diversity that you get as a result of that and the different attributes that come with that kind of workforce, right? So you're talking about, um, you know, a, a loyal workforce, if you're thinking about the traditionalists, but then you're, you think about a Gen Z and they're adapted to technology. What's the other thing we know about uh, that last generation? And that's that they're uh, wanting to work face to face, right? So now all of a sudden you can see where those two things are starting to meet again, because the ones in the middle, the generations in the middle want to work from home. So really what and how do you take advantage of that? You know, the traditional education, work, retirement, it's a multi-stage circle, you know. I, uh, I will have multiple careers in my lifetime. My granddaughter will have multiple jobs at one time, right? And that's, that's gonna be okay. My father had one job. Right, and, that's, and that's, the, that's the difference here. So traditional retirement, those types of things, I don't think will happen. You'll be lifelong learner, learners. We'll have lifelong learners. So what can you do to stay ahead? I think it's very important uh, to determine how people want to work. You know, it's not always about 
filling the job. Now, I work for a staffing company, the largest staffing company in the world, actually, and we're all about filling jobs. But even we have to talk about um, to our customers how to get the work done. So sometimes it's looking at technology, looking at automation, looking at completing uh, a project. What kind of talent do you need to get that done? Can you just hire somebody to get the project done rather than hire a traditional full-time worker? Not only will you need to do that in order to get the work completed, but that's the way the population at large and the talent at large is going to want to get the work done. So in terms of skills transformation and uh, you know, the impact on the workplace, I think you should ask yourselves now, what are you doing to reskill your population or, and, and, your, and your workforce? You know, filling the jobs, it's not, you know, I, I just heard you know, where you guys are at, uh, where Poland and Warsaw in particular is at economically. I heard this 2% unemployment in Warsaw. If you think you're gonna fill all the jobs that are out there, that's probably not gonna be the case. So really the future is gonna be about reskilling your workforce, having an understanding of what you're gonna need uh, and rethinking, right, that traditional worker. You no longer need to worry about, well, they don't know how to program this type of code right so I can't put them in that job they'll leave you because the next person's going to train them on the next line of code so I'd ask yourselves today when you leave here you know what have you done to really assess your workforce and assess your talent and how will you prepare for the future not just automation not just technology but really for a multi-generational workforce a few, uh, and I got 30 seconds left, a few things here. So as I mentioned, I work for Ronstad. One of the things that we, do, we have done is put together our own um, online sort of cross-cultural uh, site. It's kind of sort of our own Facebook, if you will. This has really helped us cross boundaries and really helped us uh, with the cross-cultural engagement. It's really driven workforce up quite a bit or engagement up quite a bit. The last, uh, last couple of points is we also have a mission to touch 500 million lives. So in order to have an engaged workforce, people want a purpose, uh, and we're really proud of, of that. And then last, our uh, Ron, Ronstadt at heart is our social platform and where we allow people to give back hours and engage in the community. So I'll leave you with one last thought, right? In today's environment, it really starts with all of you, and I would ask all all of you to help lead the change. Thank you.